Hello, my name is Homer Knox, and I'm at the Life Center in Bradenton, Florida. I'm going to be teaching the, tonight on the Bible to the men at the Life Center. Second Peter, the first chapter, the 21st verse. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. When you talk about the Bible, you have to say, how did we get the Bible? We got the Bible because the Holy Spirit impressed upon men to write it. And that's how we got it. And the second question is, how do we use the Bible? What are we to use it for? 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 16 to 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Well, let's define some of this here. It's profitable for doctrine. You know what doctrine is? Doctrine is a set of beliefs. It's held, the doctrine is held, and it's taught. We have doctrine here at this church that we believe. Christian churches have doctrine. And then it says it's for reproof. Reproof is conviction or evidence. Conviction or evidence. And then it says it's for correction. It's for straightening things up. Sometimes we need straightened up and to get the Bible and say, well, this is what the Bible says. This is what you're doing, and this is what the Bible says. Correction. And then it's for instruction, which is education, instruction. And then it talks about being made complete, you're perfect, and for every good work, every good work. Work is an act of labor. And I can teach because of the Word of God. The Word of God gives me the opportunity and the ability to teach. John, the 17th chapter, the 17th verse. Thy Word is truth in the Bible. Okay? Now, am I realistic to say that all the T's were crossed exactly and all the I's were dotted exactly? No. But it, they're so minor. But we, can, we believe it's without error. And if you don't believe my teaching, i just like you to look it up and tell me where I'm wrong. Use your scriptures. Say, hey, I don't know whether I agree with this. John's done that. He said, I don't remember I agree with this, Homer. And you use the Bible to look it up. And I've had pastors say things that I thought, well, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that one a little bit. That didn't get down very easy. And so, but that's what you do. You look at the Word and you say, hey, is this right or not? And that gives us our guiding. That's the guiding force in the, in the Christian world is the Bible. It's the guiding force. Okay. I want to talk about languages of the Bible. You've got a whole Bible there. What are the languages that they were written in? Hebrew and Greek. Greek. Hebrew and Greek. Old Testament is what? Hebrew. The Hebrew, Old Testament is Hebrew, written in a Hebrew language thousands of years before Christ. Long time ago, okay? And then we have Greek. Greek was written not as long, I'm not sure when it was written, but it's written in the Bible since the New Testament is all after Christ. It's using that Greek version after Christ. Okay, so you got Hebrew and Greek. Now, there, in the Greek, there are history of the documents being passed down. 2017 years ago, Christ was living. That scripture is not around anymore. Okay, and so there's, a, there's copies made, and you can look up the New Testament, the copies, what they used over the years. Uh, in Hebrew and Greek, each language might have a different meaning to the same word. Okay, it doesn't translate that easy. You have to work at the translation. And they're not compatible. They're not compatible with English. And so you, you look at the words. You look at the meanings. The meaning of an English word might have several meanings in the Greek. We're going to look at a Greek example here. Okay. Uh, the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts are gone. They're not around. But they've made copies. And they made copies. A person who copied scripture is called a what? A scribe. A scribe. It's mentioned... 52 times in the Bible. They were an important guy. And they took the original documents and, tra and translated them, or copied them, I'm sorry. They took the original documents and copied them over and over again. And that's what they did. Okay? And God did not allow the Bible or His Word to be corrupted by human error. When He rewrote it, God didn't allow them to make mistakes. And that's why we say the Word is infallible with no errors. I'm going to show you how they did it. I'm going to show you how they did it. They would count the numbers of letters and spaces and punctuation in a series of scripture. And then they would copy that. 
Okay, and then they would count their numbers of the copy. How many letters did it have? How many spaces did it have? And then if there was a difference, they know the new copy is an error. I've given you a little sheet of paper with one line in the scripture. I want you to count the letters, the spaces, and all the punctuation there. And tell me what you get. You'd give them to somebody to check. They knew how many letters and spaces there were. They say, in this chapter, there's 5,000 letters and spaces. And so then they count yours. You're the scribe. They're counting your stuff. And if it wasn't right, <coughs> you made them do it again. And that's, that's how they got that perfection in that. Now we talked about it's infallible. Let's talk about some proof. You, you all know about it. Maybe you don't know. You know about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. They found some scrolls in Israel down by the Dead Sea in copper pots, thousands of them. And they're 2,000 years before Christ. They're really old. And they compared it with the New, the Old Testament now. And it's almost right on. Very little variation, almost right on. That's all those years. And so that just helped to confirm the infallibility of the scriptures. All right? And so we talked about the Bible, we talked about what they use it for, we talked about the infallibility. Let's talk about Bible translation now. It's Greek and Hebrew, we're going to bring it into English. Your Bible's English, and so we've got to bring that Greek and Hebrew into English. Okay? There's a ministry called Wycliffe um, Bible Translators, and they're all over the world, they're everywhere. And they work with real small tribes that don't have a Bible. And they go in and live with these people, whatever the tribe is. And then they learn their language, and then they write the people a Bible. Okay, and that's what, that's what Wycliffe does. And the major translations, we got King James, we got New American Standard, uh, we have Revised Standard. The way they were written is they got a team of about 30 to 50 people, language scholars, and they wrote the Bible as a group. And they went through letter by letter, by, by word, by paragraph, and then, and then they did the translation on that. Okay, not an easy job, not an easy job. There are many tra great translations. I use New American Standard. When I got saved, my in-laws gave me a, a, when I got saved and I married my wife, they gave me a King James Bible. And I couldn't read it, I couldn't understand it. And it was difficult for me. And so, so I hunted and I got American Standard Bible. But there's a bunch of great translations. There's a New, New King James, a Revised Standard. You got the um, NIV. You got the NIV. And there's some good, there's really good translations. You know, as you're looking for a good Bible, and as you're growing the Lord, you should be looking for a good Bible. Bible. Uh, check it out. You know, check some of these out. Read a couple of them. See what you like. There's a translation called the Phillips New Testament. And sometimes when I get dried out reading the Bible, you know you can get dried out reading it sometimes. That's the translation I like that gets me back into the swing of thing again. It's called the Phillips New Testament. Uh, when I was first married, Bonnie and I were first married, we went to a non-credited Bible school. You just go there and it's, a, it's, just, it's not a college, it's just a local group of pastors getting together. And so you had, you had Bible study and then you had a break. And at the break I was talking to this guy and he said, you know, if you don't know King James, you can't get to heaven. And I said, what? He said, that's right. Got to know King James to make it to heaven. And so I said to him, what about the Chinese? They don't know King James. It's too bad. That's what he said. Too bad. You got to know King James. And so I was real nice with the guy. I mean, but... That's what he thought. A lot of people are hard-nosed on King James. They think if you don't know King James, that's it. You know, that's the only translation. And uh, so we don't think that way, but I wanted to share that with you. Now, we got translation. Now we're going to do paraphrase. What's a paraphrase? It's not a translation. Translation is love equals love. A paraphrase is love equals warm feelings, love equals good going. It could mean many things, and they use it to help explain the verse. And there are great paraphrases out there. The Living Bible is a very good paraphrase. There's the Message Bible. In my New American Standard Bible, a lot of places I'll have, I'll write in Living Bible and, and that verse. And that's because I want to take that when I read the New American Standard and go to the Living 
Bible, and it gives me clarification on what that's saying. It, it, it's so much better, but it's not a translation. It's a pa rewording. Um, and so you got to remember that. It's just a rewording. Now, there are false Bibles out there. The Book of Mormon is a false Bible. Okay? Book of Bible. Jehovah Witnesses have one. It's called the New World Translations. It's a false Bible. My recommendation is don't read them. Don't get one. Don't allow people to give you one. Stay away from them. Revelation, the 22nd chapter, the 18th verse. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. The Bible is complete with the book of Revelation. There's no more additions. And so the Mormons have added. They have their own book. Okay. God specifically says don't do that. Don't do that. We want to talk about word usage here a little bit. And I'm going to give you a Greek example. And I didn't learn this. I stumbled onto this at Harrisburg Bible School. And, and here's what I want you to turn in your Bible to John the 20, 20, Gospel of John, the 21st chapter, verses 15 to 17. John, the 21st chapter, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Ten, my lamb. John, the 21st chapter, the 16th verse. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. John, the 21st chapter, verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. John 15 to 70. Now we're talking about a word usage here from Greek to English. Let's look at the 15th chapter, or the 15th verse, 21 15. And when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, loveth thou me? That word for loveth is agape. It's a strong love, it's the strongest love you can have. And he's saying to Peter, do you love me? The strongest love. All right? There are four loves. Peter says, yes, you know I phileo you. Yeah, phileo you. It's a different, it's not a strong love. It's a friendship love. So Jesus says, do you love me with all your heart? Peter says, sure, I love you as a friend. See, the word is love there for both of them. Okay, do you understand that in the verse? Yeah. Okay, two different words there for love. Jesus says, I love you with all my heart and everything. Peter says, you're my good friend. Okay, then Jesus does it again. He's given Peter a chance here to step up. He says, uh, Simon, uh, son of Jonas, loveth thou me, agape. Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, yea, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You're a good friend. You're a good friend. Okay, that's not what Jesus asked. Okay, and then the third verse in 17, he says unto him, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth, and Jesus switches now to phileo, because Peter couldn't say agape. He wasn't going to say it. And so Peter, or John came, or Jesus came back to the phileo name. Okay, the, not as strong, not as strong as what Jesus wanted. And Peter was grieved, and he says, Yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. Phileo. Okay? So you see what I mean about words? Can I have multiple words? I've given you two words here. There's four words for love. Agape, eros, E-R-O-S, phileo, and storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. And that's why some of the scriptures, sometimes you read it, and it's, it's not really clear. And it's because of that word usage thing. It's because of that word usage thing. And sometimes you just have to do research to get meanings of scriptures. You can't pick it out without doing some research. Uh, where I come from in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there's a ton of Dutch and Amish there. Dutch isn't the right word. There's a ton of uh, Amish and, and plain Mennonite there. There's a language spoken that they speak. It's called Dutch. Did anybody hear a Dutch language? There's a Dutch language. There's 300,000 people in the United States that speak Dutch. Now, they speak English, 
but they speak Dutch. You know, when they preach, they'll preach in Dutch, and then they'll forget and speak on English. And so they'll go back and forth. Okay, very interesting. And so they asked an Amish pastor, and they said, what is the Dutch word for this English word? And he said, there is none. Isn't it interesting? No, no translation on that. No translation. The best authority for Bible meaning translations is what they call a Bible concordance. And they might have one up here. Um, it's a listing of every word in the Bible, and it's an alpha listing, A to Z. And it will give you the meaning. It will show you every place it occurs in the Bible. Every place. And um, what else does it have? Alphabetical listing. It shows every word, and it defines the word. And so that's what a concordance is. Um, I have Power Bible CD on my computer and that has the Strong's Concordance tied in to the King James. And so example, I go through my King James verse, that verse in King James, and I point on any one of the words and bang, it gives me the Strong Concordance number. They're all the words are numbered. It gives them the meaning. It gives me where it used. And so I gave away my concordance, which is this thick and this high. It's a big book. So I gave that away because I have it automatically on my computer. You know, it's wonderful to place our hope, and our hope is placed in the Bible. That's where our hope comes from, to know that the Bible is true. When, you know, when Jesus says He loves me, He loves me. He loves me. He means it. When He says He's preparing a mansion for me, He means it. He means it. And when He says you've got to be born again, you've got to be born again. He gives the criteria, and He means it. James, the first chapter, the 17th verse. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Every perfect gift from the Father of lights. No variation in the Word of God. There's no, var no shadow or turning, no changing. What He says He's going to do, He's going to do. How wonderful. Praise God. Because a lot of that pertains to us, doesn't it? What He says He's going to do for us and with us, and while we're here, he's going to do. Going to do. I've given you just a little summary here on some Bible things maybe you didn't know or think of. Hello friends, this is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And are you saved? If not, why not? Why not? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day after burial. And he's ascended into heaven according to the scriptures. There is salvation in no one else. No one else. And so if this has stirred your heart and you'd like to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. Come into my heart. Please forgive me of all my sins, all my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a new creature. And thank you for the Holy Spirit now living inside of me. Amen and amen. If you prayed this prayer for the first time from your heart, you're now born again. You're a Christian. Welcome. Welcome to the family. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, you're now back in the fold. You're part of the kingdom. Welcome. Congratulations. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved, Now What? And that video will help you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.